I wasn't doing well. I was in crisis. I didn't know it though. So I was almost totally isolated by this point. By the time I was having run-ins with the law, my friends were like, what's going on with you? They didn't really want to have anything to do with me. Eventually, the voices became so commanding that I took a rock and threw it through the car window, climbed inside, ate some pills while whatever was on the floor. I was involuntarily held for a week under the Mental Health Act. And during this week, every time I was questioned whether I heard auditory hallucinations or not, I would deny them. I was afraid that if I was honest about hearing voices, my family and friends would be hurt or injured. My dad said that he, he used to have to work with me a lot to try and coax me out of my depression, take me for drives, spend time with me. This was time that was taken away from my brother and sister. And, and it's just a small example of how schizophrenia affects every member of the family, not just the person who has it. You know, I thought, I, I can't be mentally ill. You know, I'm too smart to be mentally ill. I'm too strong to be mentally ill. And I'm, I'm too normal. You know, I'm not bizarre. I don't have an eccentric personality. Because I didn't know that mental illnesses are, in fact, brain disorders. I didn't know they could affect anybody. And I didn't know that that's exactly what my problem was. You're about to hear four amazing stories, stories of recovery and emergence from schizophrenia, from four people who've been there and not only manage their illness every day, but have worked hard to make some of their dreams come true and give back to their communities, giving hope that many people with schizophrenia, with awareness, proper treatment and support, can live a life in recovery. Welcome to our podcast, Schizophrenia, Three Moms in the Trenches. From the place where schizophrenia and real life collide. East Coast, West Coast, Middle America. With Miriam Feldman, Mindy Greiling, and Randy Kay. Finally, a place to talk about the truth. Welcome to a very special episode of Schizophrenia, Three Moms in the Trenches. We have with us four guests, and we're very excited to hear their stories. I'm Randy Kay. I'm here with Miriam Feldman and Mindy Greiling. We are three moms with three sons. Each of our sons has schizophrenia. We've written three books, and tonight we're focusing on a different book that has just been released. Mindy's got hers. I've got mine. It's called <laughs> Awakenings, Stories of Recovery and Emergence from Schizophrenia. One of the authors, Bethany Yeiser, am I saying your name correctly? She's smiling, so I guess so. We are going to dispense with our usual chatter before we bring in the guests. And if you're watching us on YouTube, you can see our guests are right here. And what I'd like to do is just turn it right over to you, Bethany. You're, you'll be telling us one of your stories, but you're also one of the authors of the book. So I'm just going to turn it over to you. And we're going to hear four stories of recovery and emergence from schizophrenia. So welcome to this very special episode. Just be aware, this episode may go a little longer than our usual episodes, which are seldom more than an hour. If so, listen to as much as you can and listen to the rest the next day. So it's fine. We are very, very excited to have all of you here. Hello, Bethany. Hi, good evening. It's really a pleasure to be here. So Awakenings features 28 stories of full recovery from schizophrenia. Uh, I am so delighted and honored to know the people who have been featured with me in our new book. And tonight with me, I have three people, Jay Peters, Leslie McQuaig, and Leif Gregerson. And each of the four of us are going to tell our stories. And um, again, I'm, I'm very excited to appear with these colleagues tonight. And I'm gonna share my screen, and then we're going to hear first from social worker and author, Jay Peters. Make sure that it's working here. Give me okay. just a second. Okay, there we go. Let's see, is that right? Yes. Okay, Jay Peters, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to say, it's really been quite remarkable. Um, to be featured in Awakenings. And I was not um, not shocked because I had known one of the authors, Will Bethany, prior to the release of the book, but I was very excited to contribute. And I think that the book is a, a great testimony, not just for all of the contributors and their diverse experiences and, and their lives, but it also is 
extremely inspirational and really just um, adding to the the discourse of mental health recovery, which is underfunded by writing. People aren't writing enough and they need to. So thank you, Bethany, for allowing me to contribute. I'm really very excited and I hope the book is, is well received as it should be. Um, so my name is Max. My real name is Max. My pen name is Jay Peters. So it, depending on how you know me um, or how you interacted with me or where you came into my life, um, you know, you can know me as either one. So really, I was born Max, Max Gutman, uh, Max Edward Gutman. And uh, next slide, please. My pen name is Jay Peters. I chose that, but we'll talk more about that. So um, it really has to do with, of course, schizophrenia. It's what we're here to talk about. So schizophrenia snuck into my life in college. And uh, this is a picture here of me sort of like in the prime of like those fun days in college. Um, it was like a night, I think, where we were all just sitting around having fun. Uh, it's a friend of mine that I still speak with. One of the few friends I still speak with from those days. Um, most of them aren't in my life anymore. Um, and, you know, that has to do with just how the disorder sort of works and isolation. And um, sometimes, you know, um, we don't always behave in the way we'd like to around our friends when we're sick. So sometimes they leave. Um, but that's a picture of back then in 2007, 2008. And again, I was in my last semester. Most of my friends had graduated and I didn't really have a plan. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I did know that I was interested in pursuing English. I was an English major and it seemed like the right thing to do. Just keep going. Next slide. So around the time when it was let, like, keep going, what am I doing? What's my plan? Um, the delusions and hallucinations started. I became very delusional around what my status was as a student. Was I graduating? Was I not graduating? Was I a graduate student? And um, I'd applied to the Binghamton University um, graduate department in English. And um, about a month or two later, after I was rejected, I was arrested during course registration. Uh, it was confusion around why I was in the department. This is a picture of me outside the Vestal Courthouse, which is Vestal, the town of Vestals in Binghamton, right outside. Um, so the police are from there. So that's me posing sort of um, audaciously um, outside the courthouse, but with a university faculty member who had been fired and we were living together. Uh, strange short occurrence, but I was posing um, because I thought this was a cool thing. And I thought that what was happening to me was very cool. Whatever was happening, it seemed very, you know, um, exciting. And here I am, in, in, you know, posing in front of the camera in the courthouse. So I liked, I love this photo. My parents hate it. You can see my eyes, I sort of look sick, um, you know. And um, I was wearing a leather jacket, two leather jackets, which I bought, spending a lot of money, nice shirt. But really, I, I was, I was, um, I wasn't doing well. I was in crisis. I didn't know it though. So I was almost totally isolated by this point. By the time I was getting, having run-ins with the law, my friends were like, what's going on with you? They didn't really want to have anything to do with me. They were worried, they were concerned. Um, and um, eventually, after all the concern built up and the delusions and places came to a dramatic climax, um, and I thought that a bomb was going off in my house and I ran outside naked, eventually, um, the voices became so commanding that I took a rock and threw it through the car window, climbed inside, uh, sat in there, ate some pills, whatever was on the floor, um, and uh, threw the rock through the other side of the of the of the car on the uh, passenger side. And uh, I think I sat in there for a little while, climbed out, and then the police came and took me to the hospital. I still remember looking back in the cop car as the car was pulling off. I remember just that professor I was living with. Just sweeping up the pieces, and I thought that was, I thought that was kind of interesting because it was almost like a, all the mess that I had created, and now it's all finally over. And here she is, just sweeping the remnants of the disaster that I had created up there in Binghamton, New York. Next slide, please. So eventually, um, initially, I was taken to the community hospital up there, and uh, I was totally confused. It wasn't long. Um, before I was 
taken to the unit once I'd been in CPEP or like the admissions area. I remember um, being very agitated or so the paperwork states. I took a, a can of soda, crushed it in my hand. And before I knew it, I woke up on the unit. Um, I guess they had injected me with something and I don't remember or so the paperwork says. But when I woke up, I thought it was an FBI CIA training lab. And uh, it was extremely confusing. I had no idea why I was there. All I knew is I was very hungry, very hungry, uh, because I wasn't eating much prior to being in the hospital. I'd run out of food and money. So when I got there, I was eating. And between that and all the meds I was taking, uh, or, you know, supposed to take, I was hungry. Um, but, um, you know, I refused medication whenever they gave it to me. I thought they were FBI, CIA bargaining chips to whatever, who the heck knows. And um, eventually, after not taking my meds and see, lunging at a psychiatrist, or so the paperwork says, and I think I threw like a rag at someone um, that was dirty. I was in a lot of, it was very confusing and disturbing. Um, um, I was punted to the state hospital nearby, uh, Binghamton State Hospital, Greater Binghamton Health Center now. And uh, I remember um, my mom, I called my mom and told her I was leaving and she got excited. She thought like I was getting better, but then found out that I was really going to a higher level of care. Um, and once I was in the state hospital, I was monitored on a one-to-one -one level. Um, I was trading food. Apparently you're not supposed to trade food with your people that you sit with and eat. So I got into a lot of trouble with that. They isolated me. I couldn't eat with anyone for a while. I was a flight risk. I mean, I could, it was horrible. I was at, at, at the, in a state hospital. I could go outside and walk around. I think they even went to like a state fair that year, like the people in the hospital unit. But I was restricted to the unit for J. Peters. Um, next slide, please. So what got me out of the hospital was I agreed to a intramuscular injection. Eventually... You know, I it got to the point where it's like, what am I doing here? I remember we sat at a family meeting and the doctor said, where is this headed? What does Max want for himself? And I said, I'd like, you know, I want to go home. And my and my parents were like, well, you know, we, we're not quite sure what to do. Nothing's really working. And that's when they made the argument that if I take an injection, they were pretty, pretty sure that I would respond to it um, and I'd clear up and be able to manage on an outpatient level and deal with my symptoms as they as they were and they were right after i took my first shot in the hospital um i started clearing up right away the delusions dissipated the hallucinations pretty much stopped i couldn't talk to the voices anymore i didn't hear them talking to each other um and you know i was discharged back to my house in the community and, and where i grew up in westchester new york so these are shots pictures of me getting my intramuscular injection on an outpatient level um, throughout the years. And I think the best was during COVID. Uh, never missed a shot, even during COVID. And I, I take pictures kind of secretly sometimes, I probably shouldn't, of them giving me the shot. I, so I can send them to my friends and family to let them know I'm okay. You know, that I'm taking, um, you know, adherent, all is well. I'm on track. It's another month. And I think the shots are cool. So, um, you know, it's about my health and that should be important. So I should record it. Um, but the point is, these are, this is me getting my shot over the years. Um, next slide, please. And, you know, over the years during my recovery, there were setbacks. I like to think of them as learning moments, but I learned a lot about my disorder over the years. Um, you know, I spent my, all my time reflecting on how I could get better and how I could improve my situation. So, you know, over the years, I accumulated better insight, exercised better judgment, eventually returning to the school at a community college level so I could prepare for matriculation into graduate school, and eventually returning to graduate school at Binghamton, where I had been arrested when I was sick uh, for social work school. Next slide, please. So in order to you know, make it at the graduate school level and learn about my disorder at this higher level, You need I needed a good treatment fit. I didn't know what worked. Um, and there is no one size fits all really um, way of going about mental health treatment. I can tell you that as a clinician, um, but especially for schizophrenia, when the clinical picture is so complex, you really need a really good treatment fit. It's going to be more nuanced and there's going to be more 
um, factors that the clinician and, and um, person in treatment needs to consider um, in order for them to experience improvement in their situation. So, um, you know, given that that's the case, and it was just reinforced when I was in graduate school and, you know, as a um, student learning to do social work and working on an ACT team and, and all that um, in the Southern tier of New York, learning about evidence-based treatment and, and what was going on and, and what people are learning to, you know, treat people with mental health disorders. It only helped and added to my insight of, you know, my disorder and how to help others. Next slide, please. So, you know, after coming home and graduate from graduate school and becoming a social worker, um, clinician working with children and adolescents um, as a therapist, and, you know, eventually getting my clinical license um, becoming a licensed clinical social worker and working in a clinic, outpatient clinic, supervising other students, being a teacher. Um, I said to myself, how could I reach even more people? You know, I was very, very much um, local. I felt like I was working on a micro basis, even though I was doing all these things. But I thought that maybe given my unique situation, people further than where I had been reaching um, needed to hear about it. I needed more latitude. So I said, what's better than the internet for latitude um, to reach people? So I created a blog, it's called Mental Health Affairs. And now it has a library control Congress number. We applied for that. And this is a NAMI blog that I wrote, one of many that came from my blog, uh, Understanding and Managing Psychosis. So I, you know, a lot of the literature that I've written in Mental Health Affairs is all over the internet in different um sites like NAMI um, and um, uh, psychology journals, um, other blogs. You'll find a lot of the writing in mental health affairs um, has traveled. And my I guess my suspicion was right. I really should have more latitude and reach and people should learn and benefit from the information that I have. Next slide, please. So in keeping with that, I said, what's better than really um, reaching people with my story, you know, if I if I do that, maybe I should have more of a story to tell um, than just, you know, speaking and talking about my experiences. Let's really, let's really go full circle and um, incorporate my love of literature that I had as an English major and start writing uh, my memoirs. Really, really write. I remember when I first got home from the hospital, a friend said, you got to write this down. And eventually I did. Eventually everything um, turned into a memoir. So here we have University on Watch, uh, which is the memoir about um, first getting sick in college, really starts off pretty much at the activation of my symptoms up until graduation. Small Fingernails is about more, um, more getting to college and, you know, my first romantic relationship. It's more of a fun book. It was actually recently translated into Portuguese and is now available, um, you know, in that market. Nunca Fuemar uh, is the title. And uh, Wales High School, Wales Middle School are about earlier education settings that I, you know, um, had fun in or um, lived. Part of my lived experience as Jay Peters, right? This the pseudonym that I picked to talk about all of my lived experiences throughout the years in mental health. Next slide, please. So presently, um, when I'm not writing or being a social worker or a therapist or, you know, a private practice owner, you know, I like to give back to my community and uh, not just the people on the internet, my local community. So I linked arms with DOMH and Department of Mental Health and Hygiene in New York City uh, as a CAB member. Um, so the Consumer Advisory Board um, and eventually I was elected chair for that and reevaluated different programs that are coming out in the city to help people with um, mental health disorders. Basically, we evaluate them and say what someone with lived experience thinks about this from a patient perspective. And in 2020, I was awarded the Bold 10 Under 10 Award from Binghamton University, which I'm very proud of. Uh, I probably should have you here to show you folks, but it was this big and it looks great and has my 
um, you know, my degrees. And they gave it to me not because I, I'm a recovered uh, per person living with schizophrenia. They gave it to me because I put a whole lot of research and writing out there. And I've been pretty vocal and I've spoken um, around the country, nowhere in Europe. Um, and I've done a lot for, um, you know, someone 10 years out from their degree. So even with a schizophrenia diagnosis. So, you know, that's uh that's where I am at today. And uh it was a pleasure speaking and sharing my story with all of you. Max, thank you so much. Um I've told people before that personally I feel like I fell from the heights to the lowest point possible and and back again. You know, people we feature in awakenings have not just dealt with minuscule symptoms or having a little trouble, you know, and your comeback from falling so far is so inspirational and amazing. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Leslie is next. Leslie has been one of my friends, Canadian friends for a long time. And she's going to talk about her journey to becoming a mental health counselor. Hi, thank you, Bethany. Um, my name is Leslie McQuaig. I have a Bachelor of Kinesiology, a master's degree in counseling psychology, and I'm a registered counseling therapist with candidate with the Nova Scotia College of Counseling Therapists. And I'm also someone who lives with schizophrenia. Next slide, please. Um, today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about my um, early life, um, my university days. I'm going to talk about a bit of time I spent in British Columbia, where I was initially diagnosed with schizophrenia. And um, then I returned to Nova Scotia, so I'm going to speak a little bit about um, about that. Next slide, please. I'd also like to thank Bethany for allowing me to be part of the book Awakenings. Um, I, at, as soon as Bethany shared the idea with me, I thought it was a fantastic project to be a part of. Um, it offers a lot of hope to people and families out there suffering, but it also helps reduce the stigma associated with schizophrenia. And that's a big part of the work that I do as a mental health advocate is reducing the stigma associated with um, with schizophrenia. And I thank Bethany for her work in the area and um, for publishing this this terrific book. So thank you. Next slide, please. So my early days is I was born in a small town of 500 people, um, just south of Halifax, Nova Scotia, um, Canada. I um, was an avid uh, participant in music. I loved playing the piano, the fiddle, the bagpipes, the trumpet, the French horn, you name it, I tried it. Um, I also had two older brothers who I was constantly trying to keep up with, um, sailing, skiing, hiking, biking, you name it, I wanted to try it. I was a very eager person. Um, my life changed a lot when I was 16. Um, my brother's house burnt down in a tra tragic fire and I started smoking cannabis as a way to cope with this trauma. Um, I was a terrific student. I was the top 20 in my university graduating class or in my high school class. I had several university scholarships and I ultimately chose to go to uh, Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, British Columbia. Next slide, please. Um, I only spent a year in Vancouver, British Columbia. I was studying geography. I was binge drinking, smoking cannabis, and doing terrible in school. Um, I decided to transfer back to Nova Scotia to um, take kinesiology, and I had a great time in university, probably way too much fun. Um, I spent most nights partying um, and most days studying. So my marks were good, but I was also developing some habits that would come back to later haunt me in life. In 2005, I achieved a Bachelor of Kinesiology, and I wasn't really sure what to do with this Bachelor of Kinesiology. So in 2007, I moved to British Columbia to teach skiing. Next slide, please. 
So I worked in the skiing industry for a year. Um, I didn't make any money. I was broke, but I was having a blast. I was still drinking daily, um, but so were most of my peers at this time in my life. So it didn't it didn't affect my ability to work. In 2007 to 2013, I was employed as an accounting technician at a real estate and insurance company studying to be a certified general accountant. Um, I ended my employment there and I took medical leave for mental health concerns and was given severance. I was struggling a lot with uh, anxiety and depression, most likely a product of my drinking. And I continued to drink daily. I'd been drinking daily for about a decade at this time. Um, I was in my late 20s, early 30s. And I decided to start going to detox to try and get a handle on my mental health. And so in 2014, I received treatment for an addiction to alcohol in a residential treatment facility in Maple Ridge, British Columbia. I'm 10 years sober now. I'm still sober to this day. And I um, am very thankful for my time there. But a year into my sobriety from alcoholism, um, I started hearing auditory hallucinations. And by 2016, I was diagnosed with schizophrenia. So I'll never forget the first time I heard an auditory hallucination. I was at a ferry terminal in Crawford Bay, British Columbia. And I was sitting in the vehicle alone, and I distinctly remember hearing a male voice. And it was a male voice I was familiar with. It was my addictions counselor's voice. And I didn't know where it was coming from, and I was confused. And I just kind of carried on the weekend hearing this voice. By the Monday of following the weekend, um, I started hearing more than one voice. I started hearing female voices, male voices. I started hearing a choir of voices. I heard so many voices and they were so loud that I actually called the RCMP and told them my neighbors were having an argument and needed to be intervened. But when the RCMP showed up to go to the house to, um, to see you know, what the argument was about, no one was home. The, the argument was actually inside my head. So I went to the hospital um, to get some mental health help. And I was greeted by a male nurse who was not very welcoming. And I was petrified and afraid of hearing voices. And it just wasn't a good combination for care. So I saw an RCMP officer in the emergency department and it totally freaked me out. So I um, I quickly ran out the back door of the hospital and wandered around the street of Cranbrook, British Columbia for the night um, for, for about 12 hours. I was um, alone in the dark, walking around the streets, hallucinating. My hallucinations were getting louder and more vivid and I started hearing what I thought was electricity running through the ground. So I started jumping on people's cars, tires um, to try and ground myself from the electricity. And it was here that I was found standing on a tire um, trying to save my life, what I thought was trying to save my life. And the RCMP came and got me and took me back to the hospital. I would be examined by a psychiatrist, but there was no beds left in, in the hospital at the time. So I was sent home to a friend's place with risperidone and some sleeping tablets. And I had some very vivid hallucinations that week. I was at my friend's place and I was not getting any better and my behavior was becoming increasingly more strange and erratic. And so um, my friend called the ambulance and the ambulance took me to the hospital uh, where I was involuntarily held for a week uh, under the Mental Health Act. And during this week, um, every time I was questioned whether I heard auditory hallucinations or not, 
I would deny them. I was afraid that if I was honest about hearing voices, my family and friends would be would be hurt or injured. And I have no idea kind of why I thought this. Sometimes psychosis doesn't make any sense, but to me, it made perfect sense at the time not to talk about my voices. So I was discharged from the hospital and I was left to wander around the public again. And I kept on having these mental wellness checks by the RCMP. And every time I had a mental wellness check, I would fail miserably and I'd be sent back to the hospital in um, involuntarily and I'd be held. I'd behave, I would, and I'd be released. Anyways, in the fall of 2015, I um, broke the law and I was arrested. And I was court ordered to see a psychiatrist and a forensic mental health nurse. It was here that I was first diagnosed with schizophrenia and I was first honest and open about the symptoms I was experiencing. Um, I would be stabilized on quetiapine and Abilify and everything in my life was getting better. I wasn't hearing any auditory hallucinations, but I also was extremely depressed and wasn't able to find my way back to the workforce. Next slide, please. So in 2017, I moved back to Nova Scotia in a family supported environment. Um, and in 2017, four years after my initial medical leave, I re would return to the work accounting technician. Everything was going really well in my life, but so well that I stopped my um, antipsychotics. And so I went off my antipsychotics and the auditory hallucinations came rushing back. Um, this time I wasn't as scared of them. Um, I knew what was going on. So I immediately went to my doctor and they sent me to a psychiatrist who um, put me back on Abilify and Quetiapine for a little while, but the symptoms kept going. So they put me on a long-acting injection in 2018. And I was on that long-acting injection for six years. Um, but I moved to a small town where uh, it's not really possible to get the injection. So I'm back on oral medication and doing just fine. But the long-acting injection gave me a lot of stability. It gave me stability that I didn't have before that. Um, next slide, please. So in 2019, I was uh, working, still working full-time as an accounting technician, but I decided to um, go back to school in the evenings and start a master's degree in counseling psychology. Um, I was also a peer supporter with Hope for Mental Health, formerly known as the Schizophrenia Society of Nova Scotia. And in 2022, I graduated and became an entrepreneur, opening my own private practice called Coastal Hope Counseling. In 2023, I became employed by a local health authority as a clinical therapist. And in 2024, I continue to advocate for mental health, specifically around reducing the stigma associated with schizophrenia. I've been um, featured in many news outlets, um, many well-known um, publications in Canada um, for my work um, trying to reduce the stigma associated with schizophrenia. Next slide, please. So I'd like to thank everyone for listening to my story. I hope that someone out there um, can relate and benefits from, from hearing it. Um, if anyone wants to reach out and contact me, they can. My email is lesliemcquag at gmail.com, and I have a website, www.lesliemcquag.com. Thank you. I hope many of you will check out Leslie's website and her feature in Awakenings. Thank you so much for your inspiring story, Leslie. I'm sure it's resonated with many of us. Um, okay, so next we have Leif Gregerson, who is a English teacher and a writer. And uh, the floor is yours, Leif. Oh, thanks, Bethany. Um, I wanted to start off and tell a little story. Um, I work for the Schizophrenia Society. 
And I had a coworker and she was a little bit older. Uh, she retired a few years back, but uh, she used to talk about the sixties and about cancer. And she said in the sixties, people did not talk about cancer. It was considered taboo. It was a black subject. You didn't bring it up in, in mixed company. And, um, but then when people started talking about it and asking more questions, there was more early detection. There was more funds raised for treatment. There was more research in uh, prevention and all of that. And um, so basically just by opening conversations, um, cancer was no longer a death sentence for, for everybody that had it. And um, a lot of people have a lot of stigma about schizophrenia and many people don't want to talk about it and they want, don't want to talk about mental illness in general. And um, I think by publishing books like this, uh, where people tell their stories, where we've got their fascinating stories, um, publishing books like Awakenings and Bethany's other two books, um, I think we, we have the ability to make a lot of positive change in the world of uh, mental illness and especially schizophrenia. Um, so once again, my name is Leif Gregerson. Um, my, I have a diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder with anxiety. Um, uh, my diagnosis didn't start all at once. It didn't even really start with me. Uh, mental illness ran through my mother's side of the family quite far back. Uh, my uncle had told me one time it, it was a complete revelation to me because I loved my great grandmother a lot. But uh, he told me that she had been an untreated person with schizophrenia. Um, so I my life started out actually really well. I was a very happy child. I, I loved uh, active play and everything. And uh, I loved the $6 million man and all those things that only people my age would remember. Um, I went to elementary school and I was given a bunch of tests. And they, they had decided that I was a gifted child. And I was qualified to go into special classes. And I was treated very special uh, by these uh, by the teacher who handled this program. It was called Enrichment. And um, so I really I felt I felt really happy about going to school. I was really excited to go to school. I didn't want to get sick and take time off. Uh, I played a, a lot of games of football uh, with a styrofoam rubber ball uh, with people I knew. I wouldn't really call my friends, but they were just the other boys. And, and we would play this with this styrofoam rubber football every chance we could get. And I was on all kinds of teams and uh, everything, volleyball, basketball, all that sort of stuff. Um, but at some point in, during elementary school, I started to change. And um, I wish I could dig the photos up, but I don't have them. Uh, but there was sort of a time right around grade three or four where there was a shift and where I went from a very happy child to being a very depressed child. And um, this, this depression that I experienced, uh, I believe now was the prodromal phase of schizophrenia uh, without having a lot of you know, uh, professional training to say that. But um, like with the pictures, you can tell the change. And um, I was just very depressed all the time. My dad said that he he used to have to work with me a lot to try and coax me out of my depression, take me for drives, spend time with me. And um, it's just a this was time that was taken away from my brother and sister. And, and it's just a small example of how schizophrenia affects every member of the family, not just the person who has it. Uh, so I went on into junior high, starting at grade seven. And it, it was the worst. I hated it. Um, we didn't do the fun things we did in my school. There was no more football games out at recess time or lunchtime. Um, we didn't have Christmas caroling. Just all of a sudden, we were expected to be grown up and to want to go to dances and things like that. And and it just, uh, it just didn't suit me. Uh, so I had a very hard time in grade seven. Uh, but I did have one friend, and, and he was a close friend, and we did all kinds of things. One thing I remember is uh, there's a there's like a 40th anniversary Ghostbusters movie coming out now. And back in grade seven, this friend of mine and I watched the very original one and we just loved it. It was it was hilarious. Uh, but the funny thing was, at the end of grade seven, my friend kind of disappeared and I didn't hear from him for years. And I found out later that he had bipolar disorder and he was in treatment in a hospital for a whole year. And then he went to a different school system. And um, I, I just found it really interesting that 
as I grew up and found out more about my my close friends, a lot of them had mental illnesses and we just kind of gravitated towards each other. Um, so I went into grade eight and something happened that, that changed everything. Um, basically, in grade eight, I went into air cadets, which is sort of a junior wing of the military. And um, I my parents forced me to go to the first meeting, but after that, I was hooked, and I, I there was you couldn't keep me from going. I just thought it was so cool the way we had uniforms, we had real rifles, we had flags, we had a band. Um, there were all kinds of activities from uh, drill, drill and range, and they would teach us uh, first aid and theory of flight, air crew survival, things like that. Uh, we even had gliding, which I just was blown away for by, by doing. Um, I, I felt like I was the luckiest kid in the world being able to go up in a glider and actually take the controls when I was just 12 years old. Um, the problem came in after grade eight. I went to this uh, basic training camp for two weeks. And when I came home, I was way more gung-ho than any kid should be. Uh, I was wearing combat uniforms all the time. I was carrying pocket knives and matches and um, basically looking for anything I could do that could make me a better soldier. And um, my dad didn't like it, uh, but he tolerated it. And uh, he even helped me get uh, some of the combat clothes and stuff at times. Uh, but um, what, what happened that really kind of broke the camel's back, the straw that broke the camel's back, was I bought a BB gun without permission. And um, I kind of thought it was just a joke. I would, I would shoot at my neighbor's windows. And I think I thought it would just make a noise and hit and they'd come out looking to be angry and I'd duck back in my house and uh and and I'd think it was a joke. But then uh, one day a police officer knocked on our door and I found out that I had caused six thousand dollars worth of damage to their house. Uh the pellets were actually breaking our windows and hitting their siding and cracking it and everything. And um so I was in a lot of trouble, but I didn't end up going to a juvenile hall or anything like that. But what my parents did pretty much insist on was that I had to see a psychiatrist. Um, I went to see the psychiatrist and he asked me a whole bunch of questions, some of them pretty embarrassing. Uh, and I didn't really understand what a psychiatrist was, but he made a decision that I had to come in the hospital for observation for a while. And I did, and I went on some medication and, uh, I remember he didn't give me a diagnosis and he didn't really get in depth about what the medication was about. I did ask him and he said, well, it's going to smooth out your highs and lows. So I'm sort of assuming that uh, the diagnosis he didn't give me was bipolar disorder because highs and lows and all that. Uh, but after I was out of the hospital for a while, I stopped taking the medication and my dad asked me why. And I said, well, the doctor said it's to smooth out the highs and lows. And um, what really good is life if you don't have highs and lows? How can your highs be any high, any good if you've never get low? And it actually didn't work that way. It was more about moods and rather than uh, achievement and stuff like that. But um, my dad saw that as good enough reason. And um, he didn't insist that I take the medication, which he probably should have. But I don't fault him for it. it how do you make someone take medication, especially in a difficult situation with a 14 year old kid. So I went on into uh, grade 10. And one of the few things I learned from my hospital stay was that I hated hospitals. And so I stopped wearing the combat uniforms and carrying jackknives and all that. Uh, but I did carry matches because I started smoking at that point, which was just a terrible thing, terrible habit. But uh, um, so I went through grade 10 and I did a lot of partying with my friends and everything. And at the end of grade 10, um, I just didn't care anymore. It, it just, uh, by the end of grade 10, I, I, it, grades didn't matter. Friends didn't matter. Cadets didn't matter. And I remember getting my uh, report card, just getting fail, fail, fail on it. And, and like, as a kid who was once, you know, a, a, a so-called gifted student and all that, it just didn't occur to me that I could fail. I, I just, I, I thought, okay, well, I'll just put in my minimal effort, like, I always do. And um, so I was really shocked by this. And I decided that uh, what I needed to do was quit air cadets and focus on my academics. But by the end of grade 12, it, it hadn't quite done it for me uh, to do that. 
And um, so I, I needed to repeat uh, grade 12 after everybody had graduated that I knew. Um, the tough part about that time of my life was I was always in a depression. And it, it, it was really strange because I had everything a teenager would want. If If you looked at me, you would see, okay, he's got a sports car. He's got nice clothes. He's got a stereo. He's got a computer. He's got all these fancy things. I even... A big thing for me was that my sister had moved out, and so I got my own room. And um, so I had everything physical that someone could ask for, uh, but mentally I was a wreck. And a couple of things happened. One of them was that a, a close friend died by suicide. And then um, I lost my job at a gas station, got a job on the night shift at a, at a grocery store. And um, it was just a very difficult time. There was a lot of pressure at home, and there was a lot of pressure at work. My dad wanted me to move out. I was 18 at the time. I wanted to finish high school. And just all these things sort of came together, and I slowly started to slip into psychosis. The prodromal phase had, had sort of gone into the, the full schizophrenia situation. Um, so this, I, I, I slowly slipped into psychosis, and eventually what ended up happening was um, I did a couple of very irrational things that I don't want to get too far into, uh, but... Uh, Basically, I ended up in the hospital and, you know, it's funny because I hated the hospital and I hated hospital, all that, but um, the hospital was actually a miraculous place because somehow I was really far gone. I was, I was insane for want of a better term. And I went in the hospital and somehow they found medication that returned me to normalcy uh, within just a couple of months. Um and then I got out and um, I, I wanted to get a job right away and start working and save up for another car and all that stuff that I had lost during the time I was in the hospital and um, save up for my independence as well. Uh, but I, I did get a job, but after just three days, I was uh, fired and, and they said I couldn't keep up with the work, so they didn't need me. And um, I blame the medication for this. And so I eventually went off of it. And then I started getting this idea that, you know, maybe what I need is discipline. I just have to discipline away those voices and discipline away those delusions. And so I thought the best thing I could do at the time was to join the military. Uh, fortunately, my psychiatric records were revealed and I was kept out of the military. And um, I think it would have been a disaster if I had gone in. Uh, but over the next years, I kind of bumped around quite a bit and I would go on medication, come off medication. I tried going back to school a couple of times, um, but I was having a very hard time. And then about 10 years after I finally, uh, I, I had finally made a decision that I had an illness and I would accept medication and take treatment. Uh, and then about 10 years after that, um, I tried lowering one of my medications. And just that small change uh, led me into a very deep psychosis. And... Um, so I was very ill and I went to the hospital. This time I was very far gone and I was having a lot of trouble uh, getting along with the staff, especially my psychiatrist. And they thought I was going to have to be there for two years. And I went through some very, very difficult times. They, For a while, they were putting me uh, daily, uh, sometimes even twice daily into an isolation room to punish me. And I just kept getting angrier and they just kept punishing me. Um, but when I got out, something changed was that I was placed in a group home that was very supportive. And it was a charity group home, uh, Edmonton City Center Church Corporation, they called. And um, all of a sudden, I had regular meals, regular food, uh, regular sleep, sorry, uh, regular sleep. Um, and I had companionship because everybody else at the group home was either trained to deal with mental illness or people who suffered from mental illness. So I made some pretty strong friendships. And then on top of the benefit of regular medication and those other things, um, my dad and I had reconciled and he would drive to the group home each day and we would go walking in the river Valley. And uh, it was just a time of such healing and everything. And um, that was two when minutes I started. Or so. Two minutes sure. or so. Okay. Thanks, Bethany. Ar around that time, I uh, decided to write a book and um, I wrote it. And I had it edited, and uh, yeah, there are my books, holy smokes. Um, so the Through the Withering Storm was was about my 
life growing up uh, in a in a in a family with mental illness and stuff, and uh, the high school and the drinking and the partying and and then the psychosis that eventually resulted. Um, and then they later inspired me to write more stuff, more books about different things. There are all three are memoirs, but they sort of take a different focus. And uh, yeah, so I found the Schizophrenia Society. And all of a sudden, I, I found that I had something valuable to share my story. And um, it helped me get my books out and everything. And then I found Bethany's, uh, Bethany's uh, Foundation. And um, boom, here I am part of book number four, one of the 28. <laughs> so with that, I will go to Bethany. And um, thanks so much for your patience and for listening. And uh, I wish you well. Thank you, Leaf. I think that I just like to go back. Leaf also gives presentations for the uh, Edmonton Police Training Center. Yes, Leaf. Yeah, um, I I do that every time they send a new recruit class through. It I think it takes six months for them to put a class through, and they can have two or three at a time. And uh, basically, as I just talk to them and tell them my own story, um, sort of because of my cadet background, I I, I guess I get along a lot really good with police and everything and uh it's something i'm pretty proud of i'm also proud of leaf for going back to the hospital where he was a patient and teaching other patients creative writing as a teacher so leaf has definitely come full circle so i'm i'm very proud of that anyway so we'll just conclude tonight with a little bit about me i'm happy to be with here with you tonight my name is bethany eiser i am the first author of Awakenings, the second is my former doctor, Henry Nasrallah. Uh, the Cures Foundation started in 2016, which stands for Comprehensive Understanding via Research and Education into Schizophrenia. Uh, like Leaf, Max, and Leslie, I, I also had a very happy childhood. Um, my brother was a year and a half younger. My mom was a nurse. My dad was a pastor. We lived on five acres of beautiful wooded land. Um, we really had everything, uh, beautiful places to play. I remember Christmases, birthdays, making lots of friends through our church. Um, I was passionate about playing the violin. And when I was 13 years old, I started practicing for four hours a day. I started working with a music conservatory professor from the Cleveland Institute of Music. Um, I became part of the Cleveland Orchestra Youth Orchestra, and it was a very happy time I'm spending all my time planning college and wondering where I'm going to go to college and studying for the SAT. And um, the summer before I started at the University of Southern California, my dream school, a friend had actually arranged for me to do some volunteer work in a molecular biology lab affiliated with Case Western Reserve University. And I wasn't interested, but I decided that I would go for a few days because this person we were friends with had gone through all the trouble of getting me into this lab. So I spent a few days in the lab and I just fell in love with it. We were working on antibiotic resistance and I was learning how to replicate DNA and look for certain proteins. It was like a roller coaster ride every day, making discoveries, learning new things. And I got to USC in 1999 with the vision for exactly what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to go into research. I wanted to do clinical trials. Um, I was especially interested in cancer and in HIV. And I did pretty well starting uh, USC initially. I was concert master of the community orchestra on violin, getting good grades, working in a lab. I, I got into a USC lab immediately once I got there. I just remember um, my professor at USC would talk about how if he did this experiment leading to that experiment, you know, he could win a Nobel Peace Prize. I mean, this guy, he'd won a couple million dollars for his research projects. He was a good professor, but he was not Nobel Prize winning materials. 
anyway, so he was just talking, but to me, it was very real. And what started to happen is I'm in the lab till three or four o'clock in the morning. I'm getting really good data. I'm making a lot of progress. And at the same time, I'm just losing interest in school and my, my grades are starting to drop. And then I started to lose interest in the lab, which really didn't make a lot of sense. And I was looking for something more in life, which is a quest many of us go through. But for me, it was, it was going too deep. Anyway, the, semester, the summer after my junior year of college, I actually packed up and went to Nairobi, Kenya, Africa, where I would stay for about two and a half months. And I met beautiful young women. I made friends very quickly. I got used to the culture, you know, the friendliness and the hospitality. And I mean, I'm living in this slum area, at least for a few weeks, where I didn't have enough food and people had very few possessions, but um, I, I really loved being there at the end of the day. But I came back to the United States with some really severe, what you might call reverse culture shock. I felt guilty to have a refrigerator. I felt guilty to have a nice apartment on the university campus to be in school. Um, when I got back from Africa, I remember taking an exam in a genetics class and, you know, thinking I aced the exam and, you know, that was, that was me. I was back, you know, in the past, I'd gotten a lot of very high grades before in difficult classes, but, um, you know, I got the exam back and I'd actually failed it. And I found out that even with my best efforts, I couldn't move on. All I could do was think about Africa and my delusions were turning into my life. So about the time I was supposed to graduate from USC, I actually dropped out of the university. I told myself I was not trying. I told myself I was the next Mother Teresa and that if I did try, then of course I could get A's again. I was in complete denial. And I also cut off friends and family. I got very paranoid of my mom and dad, paranoid of friends, professors, friends from my church. And this started a period of homelessness, actually, which would go on for four years. And for the first three years, I was doing a lot of hiding in lounges and libraries and the last year, I actually started hallucinating. I started hearing voices very similar to Leslie's description, a lot of auditory hallucinations, um, chorus of voices, different characters coming out of the chorus. And I remember uh, March 3rd of 2007, I woke up in this churchyard where I'd been sleeping every night. Um, I noticed it was a place homeless people weren't asked to leave. And I was just screaming back at these voices inside of my mind. Um, they would tell me to shout profanity, and I just wanted relief. They were so loud. They were so annoying. So I would just, you know, I started shouting profanity, which was very out of character for me, just because I wanted relief from the voices. And I was hitting myself. I was walking in strange patterns around the churchyard. And when I least expected it, a uh, police officer snuck up on me and he put me in handcuffs and told me I was being taken for observation in a psychiatric ward. And I thought, well, okay, sure, that's fine because there's nothing wrong with me. You know, I thought I, I can't be mentally ill. You know, I'm too smart to be mentally ill. I'm too strong to be mentally ill. And I'm I'm too normal. You know, I'm not bizarre. I don't have an eccentric personality. Because I didn't know that mental illnesses are, in fact, brain disorders. I didn't know they could affect anybody. And I didn't know that that's exactly what my problem was. So I went into the psychiatric hospital. I was admitted, which I was very surprised about. I was started on medication. The medication helped really a lot. The delusions were going away. The paranoia, I had visual hallucinations. They were going away. I had painful hallucinations that were almost gone. 
and they decided I was ready to be discharged and recover at my parents' home back in Cincinnati, Ohio. What they didn't tell me was that my behavior in that hospital had changed, that they had seen remarkable progress, and that was the reason they felt I was ready to get out of the hospital and recover. They also didn't tell me why I needed this medication, and they didn't tell me something that I think every patient should hear on day one. If you're on an antipsychotic and you stop that medication and you go back on it again because you need it, it can be less effective, sometimes even at higher dosages. So there's a lot of education that I really, really badly needed that unfortunately me and so many others, you know, I didn't get it at the beginning and it, it really would take years to learn about schizophrenia. This is also something I wasn't told. It's not possible to look at the brain of somebody with schizophrenia and say, oh, this is your problem. It's schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or anxiety. They can't do that, but they can look at someone's brain over time and see tissue damage. And I didn't know that psychotic episodes like the ones I was having can actually damage your brain. And you may look at those pictures and think, you know, well, Bethany, if your brain looks like the female with schizophrenia on the bottom right, then how can you even talk to us? And the answer to that is I've taken antipsychotic medication every day since 2007 when I was convinced to comply, to adhere. So I hope my brain today looks like the normal brain with schizophrenia. My medication actually heals my mind. So... The diagnosis was just the beginning, and then going off my medication in my parents' home was a disaster. I ended up in the hospital in Ohio very quickly. I'm very grateful for the doctor that convinced me to adhere to my medication and to find a dream for my life, you know, to want to go back to school. I remember him saying, going back to college, playing the violin, these things might be possible, but only if you stay on the antipsychotic medication. So I decided I would, and this started 12 months where I tried five different antipsychotics up to two at a time. Nothing was working. I was convinced I was permanently and totally disabled as I had once been told. And then I met uh, this guy. I'm here in this picture with my mom. This is Dr. Henry Nasrallah. And he got me on a medication called clozapine for treatment resistance, which I'd never even heard of. And I ended up making actually a full recovery. I would go back to school and um, I would graduate with high honors in 2011. I ended up writing a book called Mind is Strange in 2014. And my mom wrote a book too called Flight from Reason. A mother's story of schizophrenia, recovery, and hope. I'm deeply grateful for both of my parents who never gave up on me and were always convinced that I would get back my life and I would move on. Uh, this is me with my dad today. Um, 2016 was an exciting year. I founded the Cures Foundation with Dr. Henry Nasrallah. But I will say that wasn't the end of my journey. In 2017, something happened that I did not expect. I developed tardive dyskinesia, which is an involuntary movement disorder and side effect of antipsychotic medications. And my timing was excellent because in 2017, not one but two drugs were approved by the FDA in the United States to treat tardive dyskinesia. So I've taken valbenazine for the past almost seven years. Everybody should know a little bit about tardive dyskinesia. Watch for it. Be vigilant about it. You're pregnant or you're not pregnant. You have TD or you don't. Only 10% of people with TD are in treatment. So we need to see a big change. This is a huge development in psychiatry. So this is what I do today. I work on cures with our board of 15, which includes 10 psychiatrists. Um, the Cures Foundation has a caregiver's mentoring program, support groups. We have monthly Ask the Doctor events, which are for just six families to interact with one of our experts. We have some small on-campus clubs and a virtual lecture series. 
we have a newsletter, a YouTube channel. So we're, we're always busy doing something, but you can go to cures.org to learn more about us. And again, our most recent development is Awakenings. Awakenings has three parts. I wrote a collection of essays to introduce the survivor's stories. And then part two is these 28 stories, including Jay Peters, Max's, Leafs, and Leslie's. And part three is Cures resources that we feel are absolutely important to any person with schizophrenia on their journey. So thank you for having me tonight. Thank you for listening to the four of us. I hope you found our stories inspiring. You know, and again, I will say people featured in Awakenings didn't just struggle a little bit for a short period of time. Many of them fell, including myself, very, very far, but they were able to come back again. All of them understand that they need to be in treatment for the rest of their lives, that this is not something that's going to go away, but that with the right treatment, schizophrenia can be managed and there is recovery and there is hope. So thank you. We'd like to open it up for questions at this point. That's great. Can you stop the share of the screen at this point? First of all, yay. Yes. Wow. Yay. Thank you so much. We're going to kick this off uh, with Mimi, who has who chatted to me that she has a question. So Mimi, we're going to let you go first. So the question on your mind is the question on my mind. But I just want to say to the listeners, every single thing that was mentioned, if you're not watching on YouTube, but many of the links were in the slideshow, but you may just be listening. And so the links are in the show notes, which you can always access. You may have to hit read more, but just to spell out cures, it's C-U-R-E-S-Z dot org, right, Bethany dot org. Okay. So that's where you can find that and probably links to so many things as well. But we do have in the show notes, links to the blogs and the websites of all of our guests tonight. So Mimi. Okay. Um, I have to say that all of these stories are so encouraging and heartwarming and wonderful to hear. And yet, honestly, Sitting here where I am, having dealt with a son with schizophrenia for 20 years now, sounds so far from anything I've experienced that it feels to me like you're talking about something other than schizophrenia. And um, the, the, the first question that comes to my mind is anosognosia, which is the thing that, and I mean, I don't know who I'm directing this to anybody, but it um, it's a thing and the impediment and the stumbling block that certainly I know I've been up against and I know Randy and, and Mindy also with their sons. And it's such a big component in this picture. And through all of these stories, did none of you have that? I mean, I, I just haven't heard it even referred to, and I'm very curious about that. I I definitely had anosognosia. Uh, something I like to point out is uh, recently, a few years back, I was diagnosed with uh, diabetes, and automatically they put me into a class where I learned exactly how to deal with my diabetes, what to eat, what not to eat, all those things. Um, but I never had a class like that uh, for uh, schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. There were places I could go, but one thing that I, I definitely saw as a failing was there was no ongoing support. Um, I used to go to these AA meetings, 90%, uh, partially because I, I wanted to quit drinking, but 90% because I wanted ongoing support. Uh, but and, and that's what I've been able to find more recently with... with, uh, with uh, Bethany's Foundation Cures, and um, with some other uh, supports I know, uh, but yeah, I it, it's so it's so difficult, and sometimes when people want to know how I could help their their loved one or whatever who's dealing with it, sometimes I just say you know, uh, read read one of my books, or uh, um, you know read another book that maybe fits their situation more appropriately, you know. And, and I just think the greatest weapon we have against things like anosognosia is just simple education 
and and partnership peer mentoring uh and and things like that and that was leaf speaking by the way so if people are just listening they can't see who's responding and with so many wonderful guests if you could just say your name before you respond that that would help thank you so much um and i do want to hear the other things i will just add an element to this question that i notice for for most of you although um, Leaf, you you say you had early symptoms in elementary school, but it seems like psychosis for many of you didn't come till much later in life, till college or after college, or uh, you may have had a history of depression and a very long prodromal period, which we're familiar with. And if if you listener are not, that's when the gradual onset. It's called the prodromal. It's kind of before it really blossoms. So. Um, and I know from research that the later the psychosis comes, the better the out, the better the prognosis for recovery. So that I just want to add that. So you know, for you, Jay Peters or Leslie or Bethany, even though you had psychosis and it sounds horrible and painful, I'm not discounting it at all. Did you ever have conversations where you said to your parents or your doctors, "I don't know what you're talking about. I don't have this illness." Okay, Max, do you want to? Sure, sure. So I, just to answer that question in the previous one, um, you know, um, I didn't know why everyone was concerned about me. Um, and, you know, things were happening in my life that were sort of unexplainable. But, um, you know, everyone was really worried about my behavior. And while they didn't say sick, um, they were just extremely worried about me. And, you know, more and more so as as things happen, but when you wind up in the hospital, and there you're you're there, and you're not allowed to leave, and they the you know the treatment team tells you that they think you're sick, um you know that you have a diagnosis of schizophrenia, that's why you're here in tr for treatment. What other explanation could I have had about the events that had happened previously that were unexplainable, other than oh this makes sense now. I guess everything that happened to me that I didn't understand was illness. And a part of doing well and being successful is not allowing yourself to slip back into psychosis and to stay on your medication and to stay in treatment so it never becomes an issue again. I always said to myself, well, I never want to take the risk of not knowing I'm sick again. Only maybe I won't take my meds, you know? Um, but really, you know, it's really about treatment fit. Um, and when you get an intervention, the intervention being successful um, and to accumulate enough insight and awareness to know exactly why that intervention is it has been done and, and what it says about, you know, the person's life uh, looking back, if that makes sense. It so, does. And, and I think that um, we don't want to turn this into a debate because it's not a debate and, and so much respect going out to all of you. Uh, but I just want to acknowledge to any of our listeners who are having the same issues we are that our loved ones don't get it. They, you know, my son has been hospitalized 10 times and his belief, which is real to him, is that it's only because I made him go. So I totally agree that peer support and education is huge and so important. I uh, just want to acknowledge that for some people, they haven't gotten to the place where they're willing to accept that that help. And, you know, thank God that all of you got to that point where because that is the key. That is what we all want for our children, that they would, if we go, they're going to go, well, I'm going to keep taking my meds anyway, because life is better. That is the wish that that we all have. And I'm so glad that you that you all have it. Some of you are practitioners, though. And you are working with people with mental illness. So as a practitioner, have you ever come across a patient who just says, no, you're wrong? Have you ever had that as a social worker? Hi, I'm Leslie. Um, I can speak to that. I'm a I'm registered counseling therapist candidate. And um, I certainly have come across, um, I, I find it hard to pronounce Agnosignosia. I'll let you say it, but um, let's just call it lack of insight. That would that's easier but, to say. <laughs> yeah, I've certainly come across lack of insight into illness, and I see that on a daily 
on a daily basis. And it makes me appreciate where, where I've come from a little bit more because I do almost have survivor's guilt at times um, where you wish that you could instill with them what you've learned yourself. Um, so, so it is, it is, um, something that, um, I come across quite often. So to introduce another topic, I just want to say thank you all so much for sharing your stories of hope. I think, you know, a lot of our listeners are people that are early in the illness, either people that have mental illness or even more of our listeners are family members, moms and dads and others And I think for people to know that this is how people who have recovered from schizophrenia present is offering so much hope. I think that psychiatrists and people that work in the field, obviously not any of you, and so I'm glad some of you are in the field, um, but a lot of people don't even expect that this could ever happen. So I think that's probably the biggest takeaway for our listeners is you guys presenting tonight. But I have a, uh, I have a lot of questions. I know we don't have time, but I usually mark up the book. I have questions from your book, (laughs) but I'm going to limit myself here uh, because we're almost, we don't have enough time for all those questions. Um, But I would like to ask, because a lot of our listeners are family members. And, um, you know, one thing that really wowed me was what Leaf said that you're, parents took you when you were like 14 to a psychiatrist. I was not anywhere near that smart. My son was exhibiting all these symptoms. He did community service twice and everything was going downward, Uh, but it didn't, we just thought he was using drugs. It didn't occur to us to look into mental illness, even though my grandmother had schizophrenia. So I would like to ask um, from your viewpoints, what is the most important thing that your parents did to help you? I would say uh, my dad just uh, just never giving up on me, no matter you know how how much I might have uh, harmed him or whatever with my illness. He he always made sure that I understood that it was my illness and that he loved me and I loved him and and that was the important thing. Um, just, just as a quick thing about the psychiatrist and me at 14, uh, my mom had been seeing a psychiatrist for a number of years. And so I went to see her psychiatrist. And the reason I point that out is because there's a lot of people who have a hard time getting help or they, or they go to see a family doctor to go see a psychiatrist and it's a year to your waiting list. You, it, you can actually go like somebody who sees a psychiatrist can say, okay, well, can you see my brother for my, my next appointment or whatever? That's the fastest and easiest way to get somebody help. And I've done it more than once. Thank you. So it is about help. And I just want to hark it back to that question about, you know, why people get help and how they get help. People get are in treatment. They don't always have to think of their, why they're in treatment as they're in treatment because of an illness, like schizophrenia, or they think of themselves as, getting help with a problem and generally people that are you know in crisis or going through what we're going through are having issues there are problems in their lives that aren't things aren't working for them or else why would we be here today talking about it so you know a lot of people that i've treated wasn't about treating their illness it was about helping them with what was going on in their life and even in the hospital where they may not think it's a hospital we're here to talk about what's happening at home that's not working out for you or what's going on at school that's not working out. And that becomes a reason to meet and to work with your treatment team. And that's what's important. It's about getting, you know, how you frame help and and the care that you get, you know, why they're there. I'm going to sneak in one last question because I have this fear I won't get any more with 10 minutes left in the program. <laughs> and this one is for Bethany. So I'm gonna get one question in here about the book because uh, of my 200 questions, this might be the only one. Um, You discussed 
the possibility or the feasibility, or if it's a good thing or not, about changing the name of schizophrenia. A lot of people here have talked about the stigma and discrimination, and you discussed whether or not that would do any good. And then in your la the last section, one of your writers discussed that as well. So could you discuss the, if you think that would do any good with stigma or anything as you did in your book? Yeah, of course. So recently, the name of schizophrenia was changed in Japan and Korea, and I believe Hong Kong. Uh, in Japan, it was changed to integration disorder. And the basic theory is that people with schizophrenia cannot integrate information normally, which is why they are having auditory hallucinations, visual hallucinations, delusions. And what happened in Japan was when they changed the name, there was a huge group of people who had always said, you know, I am not sick, who actually consented to see a doctor and seek out treatment. So we've seen an example in another country where it was very successful. But, you know, I I do remember, too, we, we've been talking about anosognosia. I remember thinking it is impossible for me to have schizophrenia, you know, that that can't ever happen to me. And I didn't know what schizophrenia was. And I wish that when I was in high school, you know, when I was learning about sleep, exercise, diet, sexual health, that they'd also told us about brain disorders and their prevalence and what they look like. So, so yeah, I think we need a lot more education about what schizophrenia is and also a new name. Definitely. Yeah, thank you. And our, our very last episode, the one right before this, was about mental health literacy, just exactly about that. And I have to say that I learned a lot from hearing all of you today. But what really struck me, because my son is on a long neck, he was doing very well on Clozeril, but is no longer willing to do it. So uh, for the moment, I've learned to say for now, for now, he's on a long acting injectable, which is Haldol. And I'm very concerned about TD. So Bethany, you sharing that there are new medications to treat it was was very useful for me to know if uh, if if he's ever willing to do that. So thank you for that. But but I I know Mindy has a hundred million questions, but <laughs> I I want to point out how each of you said you need to have a dream. That was a theme for all four of you, and. Maybe you can say a little bit more about what that what that did for you. I mean, you did mention that in in the group home, and I think this was Leaf's story that you know you had companionship and structure and, and and you know the structure of your treatment as well. And I always talk about those things, you know, purpose and structure and treatment and community as as being helpful to recovery and treatment, whatever that means to you, a social worker. A, but usually with schizophrenia, it means medication. So if you hadn't had a dream, if people had said to you, oh, well, you have this illness, so just give up, do you think you'd be where you are? Do you think being encouraged to have a dream helped you? Well, in, in my case, um, I had wanted to be a pilot. I wanted to be a few things. I wanted to be a pilot and a lawyer and <laughs> all these things, which may not have been realistic. Uh, and then I went into the hospital and one of the guys that was in the hospital with me was a pilot and he had a license and he could take people flying and stuff. He never took me flying. He he tried to, but the weather was bad on the day we wanted to go. But my psychiatrist at the time was like the top psychiatrist in Canada uh, who determined whether or not people got licenses or not. So there was no sneaking around my my psychiatric diagnosis. And I remember he asked me, what do you want to do for a living or whatever? And I said, well, I'd like to be a pilot. And he says, you'll never be a pilot. And I was, I still went to uh, flying school and went for a while. And I don't regret it at all, even though it cost a lot of money and I still haven't paid off all the loans. I don't regret it all because it was such a wonderful, incredible experience that taught me so much about life and everything and about like even even just driving my car. I know that if I hadn't that tra had that training as a pilot, I wouldn't be a safer driver. Mm. And I just really felt that telling me, no, you'll never be a pilot, instead of telling me, well, if you like flying, um, you can you can just fly with a, another pilot. 
or something like that. Uh, instead of just shooting me down, I think that would have been a lot better. Maybe I can get in one more. So what, uh, Bethany, you were listing off all the programs that Cures has, but there was one that I thought was just incredible that I often uh, suggest to people to work on in their churches, in their NAMIs and so forth, uh, but that you didn't mention. And so could you talk about the program where Cures pairs up experienced family members with someone starting out? Yeah, we call it our caregivers mentoring program. We often refer to it as friends, F-R-I-N-D-S-Z. But um, yeah, we have about 45 men, women, some brothers and sisters. They've been through this. Uh, some of them have loved ones with severe anosognosia who are still struggling to accept treatment. Some of them have relatives in full recovery. So there's really a whole range. But yes, yeah, we accept, um, we accept, we accept mentees as we call them. So people write me saying, you know, I'd like to request a mom or a dad to talk to. I'll send them a very basic questionnaire asking about their loved one's background, where they live, religious preference, a few more details. And um, we're very, very happy to partner these mentors with mentees. Um, we've partnered about 200 pairs in the last few years, but yeah, we're we're always happy to help more people find mentors. So if you're interested in that, feel free to contact the Cures Foundation. But, I think it's incredible. Yeah. And I'm not going to volunteer because I mentor tons of people. And all of us, I think, on this Good. podcast get inundated. So I'm going to actually start sending some people to you. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I noticed that, uh, you know, both Canada and the U.S. are very well represented in your stories uh, as well as in the book. And I want to point out the reason that Mindy has so many post-it notes is that it it is not, quote, just stories, although the 28 stories alone would be, enough reason, would be to, enough reason to to have the book. But uh, there are, you know, your prefaces and your the information and the essays on suicide and schizophrenia and the the renaming of schizophrenia and a lot of the resources that you name are the information is in this book as well. So the stories are there, but tons and tons of resources and information. Uh, Bethany uh, or any of you, any last words, because I know you said you wanted to be done at an hour and a half. And I think we're approaching that. So I want to ask, um, Bethany, I'm going to let you kind of guide this. You can ask your, if they have any anything you haven't been able to say that you really want to be able to say before we close. Well, I would just like to say this. I think I mentioned it before. The people in Awakenings didn't just have a few days or a few months of difficulty. I mean, I remember being told I was permanently and totally disabled. And I remember, you know, having four and a half years of full-blown anosognosia prior to my diagnosis, which continued after my diagnosis. So, you know, there there is just always hope, even for people who far who fall very far. Thank you. Anybody else? I, I had one question actually. Um, those two books I can read Ben behind its voices, his voices. I've right. noticed that one in my local library. So these are Mindy's book is Fix What You Can, which okay. is her story interspersed with stories of trying to change the law in Minnesota as a state legislator. And this is Mimi's book. It, Miriam Feldman is her is her formal name. He came in with it. And on the cover, as you see, is her son Nick's self-portrait. He's a wonderful, wonderful artist. Mm -hmm. So mine is right here, Ben, behind his voices. The book is a oh, decade wow. old. I have yeah. an updated version on audiobook, if you want. Um, that came out two years ago. And the other book is another book I wrote called Happier Made Simple, because people are like, how do you stay so positive with all the trauma? And I'm like, well, this is what I tell myself. So I wrote a little a little book about that. So I'm really impressed because I almost took out Ben behind his voices from the library. But I, I just there was a couple others that I wanted to get to first. But I, I will take it out and I will All read right. it. All right. Awesome. And I love that it's in the library. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, Jay Peters slash Max, any last words? And then Leslie, and then we'll check in with the moms. Sure. Um, you know, what were you thinking about? Hope. 
is um, very important. You know, the mantra of the mental health system here in New York is hope and recovery. But, you know, it, it's so it's so important. Hope is it, it's it's a way of looking forward when today is dark. Um, it's also a reason to motivate yourself and the people around you as cheerleaders in your recovery. I mean, without hope and the idea that tomorrow can get better, why do anything to help yourself or it's just, it's so important. Um, I always hope that tomorrow is going to be better. And, um, you know, without hope, I don't think I'd be here today. I really wouldn't. Thank you. Leslie, anything to add? You're muted. I knew we'd have to say it once in an hour and a half. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for um, for having um, us speak tonight. Um, I do believe that hope is a big part of my journey, and I, I just, I just, I don't want to say, you know, repeat myself, but I hope that everyone gets a little bit of hope listening to us tonight. Thank you. So, Mimi. Last word from you. Just thank you so much for being here, all of you, and sharing your stories. It it helps and it means a lot. And thank you. Thank you. Mindy? My last words are, I encourage people to read this book, Awakenings, because I've been around, my son was diagnosed when he was 21 back in 1999. And I learned things in this book, not only that there are drugs now for medications for tardive dyskinesia, but I I learned just a lot of new factoids and things like we all know that marijuana can um, make a, a lot more of a risk of getting schizophrenia and psychosis. But in here, I read that you actually are twice as apt to get psychosis from cigarettes. I mean, there's a lot, so many gems in here that I think everybody who thinks they know everything about schizophrenia should read this book. It's It's the current stuff. Thank you. And so we, this is a, a special episode. We, we've gone an hour and a half, but every minute was well worth it. I just want to thank our guests so much for coming. And yes, the, the landscape is always changing with schizophrenia. So always throughout my journey, my son was diagnosed over 20 years ago. I have found that education and support help him and, and help families. So there's always more to learn. And it, do you pronounce it cures? See, see, cures, but it's spelled like cure, C U R E, but it stands for something else. But it's cure, S Z, which is something we would all love to do. But in the meanwhile, check out the website and the book and these wonderful stories. And thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thanks for joining us for this episode of Schizophrenia Three Moms in the Trenches with Randy Kay, Mindy Greiling, and Miriam Feldman. To get in touch with us or to learn more about our books, please visit our websites at miriam-feldman.com, mindygreiling.com, or randyk.com.